Hey panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And this is our 200th episode. And not only is this our 200th episode, as you can see, the man before you is the one and only, the podcaster extraordinaire, <coughs> the writer-director, the man on the IMDb post boat <laughs> who actually does all the interviews for San Diego Comic-Con himself, <coughs> the one, the only, that Kevin Smith. COVID survivor. We can add that now. Ah, yes. Yeah. You feeling better? I do. I feel better, but there's still, I'm still producing uh, mucus, still coughing up mucus, but I'm testing negative. Thank the Lord. Awesome. Very good that yeah to, to hear that you're in fine health. Uh, I I got to see you not too long ago in New Jersey. Yes, the stash bash. That stash that, bash, that, the twenty fifth anniversary. Time. Yeah, it seemed like such a long time ago. Um, but that was the beginning of May. It was like May seventh, I think. Correct. Um, so yeah, we're almost at a month ago from that now. Um, awesome. What a great occasion and uh, how nice we got everybody. Um, to come out and hang out and take pictures. And then the shows I thought were great. I love the three-way Q and A thing. Yeah, it, it was a fun time. Uh, I, I love the Q and A's that it, it just felt more like home because yeah. the first 28 years of my life, I was a Staten Islander and I always went to Jersey and, uh, to me going to Jersey, not so bad, but I live in upstate New York. So <laughs> it's a little bit of a haul, but uh, uh, no, no, at this point. Yeah, but uh, it was fun to go down there and see you with your friends. Uh, you were definitely talking about Clerks 3 that we're all anticipating. Mm. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I saw a trailer um, last week, and it was really wonderful. Um, <coughs> after, you know, as of when you're, when you're coming up with the movies, one of the first things you think about is, geez, I wonder what the trailer will look like. Yeah. So part of the process, hi, Shaky, where you see the trailer for the first time is um, always kind of a, a little bit mind-bending. You have to go through the process of making the movie first, but the trailer making art form is so specific. Like, I can't really cut trailers. Um, I've tried, but I don't think I'm very good at it. Uh, the fact that these cats were able to take 90 minutes and distill it into, like, two perfect minutes I was blown away by it. So I can't wait to share it. Awesome. I look forward to seeing the movie. I've been anticipating this for so long. A, a lot of me was always waiting for more rats too, but I still me think too. that's on the wayside. <laughs> you and me both still waiting for more rats. Twilight of the Mall rats. That's Twilight cool. of the Mall rats. Yep. And then on top of that, uh, we were looking forward to Moose Jaws as well. Yes, there's a there's a loose jaws in our future. Um, as absolutely, somebody's fucking dumb enough to be like, "Here's a bunch of money, go make that movie." That <laughs> it literally, it all boils yeah. down to money and trying to get financing for it and always, to put it through. Always at the end of the day, and then you know it becomes a question of like, how badly uh, do you want it? Like worst case scenario, like maybe I pay for it myself or something like that. But we've had. It's not like we've knocked on doors and, and people have been like, nah, there was one company um, that we were engaged with back and forth for a while, Shudder. Um, and I don't, you know, it's been such a long process that it, it, everything else has been able to happen before that. Like Reboot happened before that. Clerks 3 happened before that. Mm -hmm. So I think if I ever get serious about it, um, Everyone, well, folks will know I'm serious about it when I'm like, oh, we're doing it because I'm paying for it. Fuck it. But I've only really engaged with one group about doing it. And it went from a movie to like a fucking streaming series and shit. But I think it's better done just as a 90 minute joke. <laughs> More so than <laughs> streaming series. I um, think so too. I think it, it would be best suited as like a small movie. And uh, just like, uh, just as it came out of Tusk, which I was a fan of, I am still am a huge fan of Tusk, loved it. And I still left the fact that the girl I took to go see it said, I better not get any nightmares. I'm like, really? A Kevin Smith movie? You're going to get a nightmare from Kevin Smith movie? <laughs> yeah, particularly that one, Heavens. 
I was like, uh, Red State will probably give you nightmares, but not Tusk. <laughs> but yeah, you, you've you been on the scene and uh, you've been highly influential in media, as it were, throughout all these years. Fingers crossed. Well, uh, as being such a media icon, I, I uh, me and a varying few fans that I speak with about you, we all think, hey, when's Kevin going to show up in a Marvel film? Ooh, what a great question. Um, it's certainly not from <coughs> a lack of desire. It's not like I'm like, well, I've been too yeah. busy for them. <coughs> <coughs> so far, no call <coughs> for a Marvel appearance. Um, <coughs> but the moment they call, believe me, I would be there in a, in a heartbeat. Um, but Man. yeah. They've, they've, I, well, I guess what it has to come down to is somebody I know has to direct one of those movies. That's, that, that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Just you playing that role of like, kind of like how Stan Lee always was. Now, now Stan was a huge icon in Marvel, as we all know, but you being somebody who represents, I, I like to see you as a representation of the public, the, the fans that are out there. And oh I God. think. Tell Kevin Feige, Mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's. Not effective to tell me I want to be in that in a Marvel movie as badly as maybe you would like to see me in one, but it's not up to me. It's up yeah, to yeah, I know that. Kevin Feige. And uh, it's you know, I, I I wonder how long you know, I've, I've been lucky in the past, and as much as like I've gotten to work in things that I enjoy, or like Degrassi popping up at Degrassi, or, or things like that, but or Star Wars, or Star Wars, exactly, but um. You know, Marvel, man, I'm still waiting on that. Okay. I'm sure they'll knock on your door sometime soon. I don't know. <laughs> like, the best time would have been post-heart attack. Um, hmm. But, you know, they, I, 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 I don't I don't know. I mean, I, on one hand, I'm like, why would they? They don't have to. They're doing just fine. They don't need you and stuff. Hmm. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's like, well, what? what do I bring to it? And I guess most people don't really think of me as like a talking actor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, um, mostly they think of me, like when I'm in movies, I'm, I don't really talk. I think the majority of the time that I've been in movies, I've never had much dialogue. Uh, it's that one that you and Jay did where you said it's woman-like, right? Woman-like? <laughs> right, not even my movie though. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, I'm not really known for, for being like an actor so to speak but i you know i am known for loving the fuck out of those movies and being oh, yeah. really vocal about it so i i too wonder like geez will i ever call but even in there there's just this weird kind of like privileged expectation that that would even be a thing you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying like nobody really sits around going like well sooner or later marvel will call me like but yet, because of the career I've had, there is this weird kind of subtle expectation of like, well, you'll wind up in one of those sooner or later, won't you? And I'm like, I <laughs> fucking hope so. People always ask me about like, don't you want to direct one of those? And I'm like, God, no, no, no. Way. not in a million years. But you want to want to watch it or just show up on a little clip and be like, that's it. <laughs> that's the other thing. It's like, they don't even have to put me in these movies. Just fucking let me see them early. But I'm working on something. I'm, I'm working on a plan that will allow me to see not just marvel movies early but everything early we'll awesome that's cool now with the fact that we spoke about <clears throat> jay and silent bob's secret stash in red bank new jersey yeah, on yeah. 65 broad street uh with the uh whole legalization of marijuana and you're smoking right now which is fine i don't care i would love to have a bone with you and <laughs> smoke that bowl or what have you but uh where i'm at it's not legal but what now it's you? legal where are you upstate new york yeah dutchess county new york i think it's been decriminalized it's been decriminalized but i can't go buy that down the street <laughs> you can't go buy it down the street but if you have it it's not against the law oh yeah um, but it yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm in weed legal California. At the moment. Yeah, naturally, it's just abundant and everywhere. Exactly, but now that it's been uh, available for recreational use, for retail use, or sales in New Jersey, what would you call a stash weed store? 
Well, we already took Jane Son Bob's secret stash. Yeah. Um, I always thought Jane Son Bob's secret garden would work. Um, you know. All right. I I think of the secret garden. I think of the just two chicks with the That's story box and it would be us and like those girlish outfits and from the fucking turn of the century. Um, <laughs> I uh, we, that that requires us getting a license and like uh, we did we applied to try to get one of those licenses but okay they didn't give it to us um, hopefully we can partner up with somebody who has a license and if we do then Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Garden could become a reality oh wow um, it would be it would be so I mean uh, what is it it's not sad it's not tragic but I mean what a missed opportunity to have been in the state this long and, you know, with characters that, that were weed dealers and, you know, the state goes legal and we don't have a store like <laughs> with our face on it. It just seems. <laughs> have it like, in between you know, our uh, like quick stop and smog castle and just put it where like that little corner right, section of RST. RST video, but uh, Middletown township is not zoned for weed. They're what? not. They're not letting weed in. Leonardo is part of uh, Middletown Township, and uh, we went through it with the, the mayor of Middletown, who's actually in Clerks Three, um, and talked to their council. And Middletown is a fairly conservative township, yeah, uh, very Republican. So they were like, "Look, we're going to let Red Bank do the weed, and we'll see how it goes for them. And if they make money after a couple years, then maybe we'll think about it." So wow. believe me, we were you know, for the last year, <laughs> two years. That's what we've we've been working on, trying to get a weed store at RST Video, but it's not going to happen until Middletown Township decides they want to go weed legal. Even if they decide to go weed legal, that area of the highway may not be zoned for weed because right across the highway is a school. Ah, so, that's right. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. Believe me, I, that was. That was the plan. We were like, oh my God, RST will be the weed store. I mean, in Clerks 3, Jay and Sal and Bob run their weed store out of RST. So oh. it's baked into the DNA of the movie. Spoilers, but, everybody. But yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> pictures that we put up online and stuff. RST, PhD. Oh, that's pretty cool, though. Uh, I actually got to visit that that quick stop while I was down there. And I. I... Natural quick stop. Yeah, the actual quick stop. And I thought it was like, wow, this is amazing. And I'm like, I look right across the street. It's like, wow, a bunch of condominiums. Okay. <laughs> they put those up. Let me see. Well, we when we made Clerks 2, those were there. Because the boys pull up in front when the store's closed. And the behind them, it's just an open field. Um, and so that was 2006. So I guess maybe 2010, maybe I think they were there for Hurricane Sandy as well. Uh, they went up, so they've been there for like the last decade. So they wound up in the reverse shots of of uh, Clerks Three as well, wow. and um, it's a nice little charting of the landscape. You know, um, as much as like the town doesn't change, it's frozen in time. That one added section of housing is is new since we've started making movies in Leonardo. Wow. Um, so yeah, there's a, you could live across the street from Quick Stop. Um, we used one of those apartments as Randall's apartment, um, not the physical location because the physical location is meant to be the door between Quick Stop and RST. That's Randall's apartment in Clerks Three. But to shoot an interior, we went across the street and used those apartments as his interior. They're nice. That's cool. So now speaking of movies that you've done, I've already mentioned Red State. And actually, it's funny. I showed that to my mother. My mother was like, wow, this is not a Kevin Smith movie because yeah, yeah. she's heard no, of Clerks. Definitely not a Kevin Smith movie. That was the one that when I was finished with it, I was like, oh, fucking if I didn't want to be a Kevin Smith movie maker, I, I might have been able to like just be one of those standard ass filmmakers, like just somebody who makes movies that you know are just yeah. good and shit like that red state made me go like wow i could have done it all right and then i went back to doing what i liked doing. well it 
oddly, oddly enough, my mother's 80 years old. She's not into the humor that I am, that you do, <laughs> that I love. <laughs> yeah. But she watched it and was impressed. She was like, that was a great movie. Nice. She goes, who wrote that? I'm like, he did. He I'll directed it. That. I'll take that from that's so somebody who's been watching movies for 80 years, man. That's yeah. somebody who knows a thing or two about um, taking in a film the media. And if, if uh, I, you know, after all those years of seeing movies, if some dopey movie I do could like make somebody who's watched a lifetime of movies be like, wow, that was impressive. That's high watermark. Yeah. Fuck, fuck the box office. That's real. Right <laughs> well, it's, it's a matter of touching people. And I think you do touch people, not in the wrong way, but in the right way. <laughs> but in a, in a sense, you, you tickle our funny bone. You actually make us think. Uh, I've loved your stuff since Clerks. Unfortunately, when I got exposed to Clerks, it wasn't until it came out in Blockbuster. I missed out on the private screenings, everything else. I went to Blockbuster, go rent uh, Clerks, and I'm like, yeah, it's out on VHS. I open it up, I put it in, I put it in a VCR. I'm watching this movie for a while and I'm like, this isn't what I saw. It's Primal Fear with Edward Norton. Richard oh, shit. <laughs> it's a much better movie, to be fair. I, an amazing performance. That's where we all discovered that Edward Norton was a fucking thing, man. I'm like, this guy, yeah. who is this guy? He's acting like a hick, but at the end of the spoilers, he's got a secret personality. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, to be fair more vastly entertaining film than Clark <laughs> and in color and with movie stars and the guy from Pretty Woman in it for everything. Yeah. yeah, but the the funny thing was is I called the place going, hey, this isn't the movie I got. <laughs> yeah, you guys ripped me off. <laughs> exactly. So I got the, I finally <laughs> got to watch it. The only time I was able, I saw Clerks in the theaters. Unfortunately, uh, I went to go see a movie. My friend with me was like, hey, let's go to the movies. It was some over popular film at the time it that we were like this is terrible let's get out of here let's mm -hmm. go into here where do we go it's a kevin smith movie it's mall rats, mall rats. Nice. so uh i think i paid your for your oh, mall so rats the movie movies, three the times movies that were popular at the time was uh, were now and then which was a movie that had like um, young kids and older actresses, like famous young actresses and older actresses, and they played the young versions of those actresses. Yeah. That was like a PG movie or PG-13 and stuff. Then there was Get Shorty was also out that same weekend. That's true, yeah. And then Mallrats. Yeah, I... Yeah. Whatever was out before we, you know, the, from the previous week. Yeah, she was just like, oh, let's get out of here. I was like, we, we snuck in, and I think I've paid for Mall Rats five times over right now from between old digital media formats. <laughs> you were the one that single-handedly fucking financed the Mall Rats economy. Not really, I'm sure. There's a ton of your fans that have bought that movie so many times over, and I've been an advocate of it since. A lot of people were dissing it. I loved it because of... It, it just appealed to me. I was the Brody Bruce. I was the kid in the basement that lived with his parents and had his comics and all his memorabilia and, you know, kind of disillusioned with his girlfriend at the time. I was very much that guy when I had hair. Uh, I, <laughs> But I, it kind of appealed to me. And the fact is, uh, you'll laugh at this. At the 25th anniversary Stash Bash, I was waiting outside and we already said it. You said, hey... I hope everybody didn't get stuck in the rain while I was one of the people stuck in the rain. But I'm out, also out there, and I see I see it two times while I'm staying online. I didn't come here for this event. I came here for comics. And I got that from, like, two people. And I'm like, you deliberately came here. You know who the owner is. Is this Adam Moritz? It's like, man, Kevin a, is the Stan Lee in his own comic shop that's crazy oh my god i mean i guess sooner or later what are they saying dark knight you either die a hero or live long enough to become the villain so uh, but I, I i just had that uh awakening when i was there and i said this to a couple of the other people i've met while i was at the stash bash who i've had on and we talked and we talked about the weekend and how much they came far and wide to see that you know you had people coming from out of the country other states 
People love the stash. I love the stash. I get there every once in a while. Now it seems to be more of a staple of uh, live events that uh, Mike's been setting up lately. And... Yeah, the idea is, um, like, it's easy when I come to town. I could bring a lot of interest to the store and stuff. Um, but the manifest, the new manifest is, like, get other people in there. Yeah. Like, you don't, I, I'm happy to come and do stuff, but it's, you know, we had a signing, uh, I guess, what was it, last month with the kid who did, uh, um, uh, Oh, what is it? Um, uh, Harriet Tubman. Oh, yes. Fire Slayer, I think, or something. Yeah, like yeah. It was like uh, Harriet Tubman, Demon Slayer, or something like that. It was a comic book. Yes. He came into the signing. Um, the dude from what Courage the Cowardly Dog, I think, is coming or did come. Um, yeah, the idea is like get some cats in there that aren't me that just will appeal to like other people like i'll always be there you could always fucking count on me sooner or later having an event or whatnot but you know reach out to other folks as well and now with the um we launch in the fall at secret stash press it feels like an even easier way to like fill the place with other comic book folks as well now that we're part of the dark horse family yeah yeah it, you could actually get more uh celebrated comic book artists not just new and up-and-coming ones mm -hmm. you could probably have others like uh jim lee and well, jim, jim lee, Quesada. Yeah. to the east coast would be one thing Quesada, yeah maybe now now that joe is um um i guess he's i just read that he's out of marvel officially. yeah he's uh, a freelancer <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's something like two years ago he told me that was coming um so now he's officially out i bet you it'll be easier to get him to come do stuff um because it was tougher when he was a disney employee hmm. he had to get all sorts of like approvals and shit like that but now that he's free i think it'd be a smart move to get him to come and do a signing like daredevil anniversary thing or maybe I can get him to go to my co my covers. Yeah, All, uh, like uh, variant covers. Yeah. Or even anything specifically for the stash itself. And then, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to promote or marketing anything but uh, everything is all about marketing. You know that more than anything, you market yourself and uh, coming from somebody who markets themselves, is it just through the persistence of loving what you do or is it based upon you loving yourself a lot <laughs> i mean it certainly starts off that way <clears throat> being like a big fan of yourself thinking like um oh man people have to hear what's on my mind or, I, I think i have something to say um and then at a certain point like it became it went from oh i'm gonna make things to like oh my whole life is the is the art project and my whole life is the business at this point and i am what i'm out there selling I'm, I'm not in the movie business as much as i'm in the kevin smith business and movies are a part of that or something yeah just like podcasting yeah totally so there was a shift i remember at one point like being like oh my god i now i'm i'm not just a filmmaker for a living now i'm me for a living um but part of that means that everything you think about becomes this potential adventure um you know i was i was walking around the other day in the house and had this like goofy ass thought where i'm like this is nuts man like everything around here like the walls of this structure and everything that's hanging on them like is a series of never-ending wish f fulfillment right like um a guy going like i think this would be cool if i told this story and that somehow paid the bills and that paid for like this. And, and it's weird to walk around in your imagination at all times. And I don't mean in my imagination, like I live in my head, but like mm -hmm. the house is literally fucking like all this shit's my imagination, all the shit on that wall, all the shit on that wall came from me going like, what if 
like this person said this and what if what if like i made a movie about going to the mall what if i made a movie about this like that is insanely gratifying at this age to be 51 and realize like i built this shit out of fucking nothing like this is literally like it's not like i created a thing i wrote an algorithm like is literally just going like I, I just wanted to make movies and all of a sudden like this is what it all resulted in so that feels wonderful on, on at all times and because of that i've never lost interest in in the job or being creative because if something bores you like if i was ever like oh we just did a movie i don't want to do another movie yeah you know, i'd fucking pivot over to comics and pivot over to this pivot over to that so and and you know I'm, i come from an old school of thinking in terms of like when i want to make a tell a story first thing i think of is a film because that's how i entered the business mm -hmm. but now there's like so many different ways to skin that cat you don't even have to just think about that um but so far you know i've been doing it like it's coming up you know let me see it's 2022 the first time i said view askew was 1992 so it's been 30 years of dreaming mm -hmm. and then making those dreams come to life. And then because of that, getting the bills paid and, and building a, a home and whatnot. It, it's, it's a prolonged like uh, adolescence in this house because it just looks like a kid lives here. Like it <laughs> does not, doesn't look that different from my bedroom when I lived at 21 Jackson street. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I'll ever lose interest in it. It will definitely lose interest in me. The culture will long before I'll ever lose interest in making stuff. Cause what else is there? Like I just come off of COVID. So essentially I was like down for a week and change and whatnot. And mm -hmm. my God, I was fucking bored. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I don't, if, if that's what retirement looks like. Yeah. Right. I'm keep doing this shit till I drop dead, which well, would be preferable. It's all about being creative and following through with your creative passion. And I always state this, I actually brought this up to a, uh, it was a zoom call with Tom Savini, Patricia Tallman and a whole bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And Tom was talking about his school of effects and there were people there and me, I dabbled in everything. I try to be creative from the time I was in junior high. You know, I, I tried to be that person. I was trying to be a writer. Oh, I want to be a photographer. Oh, I want to do this. By the time I was in high school, I wanted to play bass. And I had terrible marks. I was a terrible student. And I started taking out bass guitar. I took your lessons. And then after out of high school into college, or parts of college that I went to, I started doing it on my own because I was pursuing that. I went to a uh, school of audio engineering. So I went to the Institute of Audio Research before that center for the media arts before they shut down. Uh, but throughout that, I was still playing in bands. I showed passion. I followed through. And that's the whole point is follow your passions as they are. And you've shown that with everything that you've done. You started that from, if you watch the, you know, uh, I'm telling this to the listeners, watch the movie clerk that you could get on amazon prime which you sent a video to your parents mm -hmm. of how you wanted to become a filmmaker and that was so original and you could already tell from that introduction of your path in life for yourself to be creative and i always say that to people who are uncertain <laughs> And especially with podcasting, like my friend Rob was just on with me before we were recording for Panels to Pixels podcast on an episode, and he just started literally about two months ago, mm. and he's got five episodes up, and he didn't realize, and he's got that itch, that tick of wanting to do it, and it's the drive. I still have this drive. Now, mind you... I work a regular job, so I have to do this in my spare time. It's the hobby I love. If I could do this as a business, it'd be great. But you invested so much in yourself to be a creator, not just in, you started with film. 
then you went from film to podcasting, then to YouTube, then you became more of a media icon in a sense where you were doing that on the IMDb boat for interviews and people know your name and your face. You, you are there. If I say the name Kevin Smith at a convention, people will know who you are. Mm -hmm. That is something to revere and say to somebody, Hey, if this guy here could do it, you could do it too. It's all about expressionism, passion and faith in yourself. And I think that's what you've given me when I started listening to podcasts on a regular in 2012. I knew about podcasting because when I do home theater installations at people's homes in 2005, I knew about podcasts, mm. but I didn't start that journey until about five or six years ago. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I eh, but, uh, and I, and if you look now during the, the, the whole thing of COVID, Everybody's got a podcast. <laughs> you saw that Quentin, <clears throat> Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery are going to launch a video archives podcast, which is the video archives is the video store they used to work at. Oh, wow. Manhattan Beach. And so they're going to sit down and talk about, you know, movies that were important to them and stuff. That's amazing. Yeah. It, it's all about they the passion. They've been Quentin this long to get a podcast as chatty as he is. Oh, he, he has a voice and he has definitely opinions too. And he's got oh, taste. <laughs> very much so. Um, talking about older movies that you've done, Zack and Mary make a porno. Mm -hmm. I love that film. A lot of people don't like it. I do. I love uh, it. Uh, the one thing that uh, a friend of mine had asked and asked me to ask you, the Monroeville Zombies jersey now you have the jersey i have the leonardo reapers jersey that is going to be in clerks three now uh will you do a re-release of that particular jersey for the monroeville zombies next uh, jersey that we're doing with geeky jerseys is the monroeville uh zombies jersey so awesome. i think they launched that you know they sell like the first half of the run and then they wait and sell the second half of the run um, I think they're going to be doing that it's either this week or the week after or something. But yeah, they're, that's the new one because that's in the movie as well. Awesome. Geeky did a bunch of jerseys like uh, for us for the flick. Um, the movies one, which uh, went first, uh, that the, the Geeky started selling. And then um, they did the uh, Reapers jersey and now they're doing the Zombies jersey and then after that is the quick stop jersey oh, i saw the quick stop jersey i think somebody started advertising it recently uh, yeah i think we, we had that up in like photos when we were making the movie ah cool i just saw a picture of the um sean at geeky jerseys periodically sends like when they go into manufacturing mode there's a series of of seam machines you know like not i guess sewing machines that make the actual crests so he sent me a photo of like all the quick stop crests are being built right now. So that means that the zombies jerseys are done and ready to go. And the clerks jerseys, uh, the quick stop jerseys rather are being built. Awesome. Uh, the only other question I have for you would be in your whole career, from the time that you started film till now, what is the most favorite thing? And you can't say clerks. <laughs> you have to say yeah. something else. <laughs> My favorite thing I've ever done? Yes. You know, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I loved making. Harley? Of course there's that. <laughs> um, I loved making like, um, Clerks 2, um, but like, you know, making Jane Silent Bob Strike Back was like fun, as was Reboot. Um, and, you know, Clerks 3 this summer was like such a blast because like that, that may have been the most satisfying on so many levels because not only did we like, hey, we made a whole ass movie, a whole ass new movie that's predicated on the, on the whole ass old movie. Yeah. But, I got to go back to work at Quick Stop, so to speak. Like we shut the place down for two weeks. So 
we owned the building. So I was just like walk up to quick stop and go inside like I used to when I had to be there. And I always like resented having to be there. Like, you know, I didn't want a job. I wish, you know, that I was independently wealthy and I didn't have to work, but I think we all do. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but I was, we were poor and, and that was impossible. So it was like work or nothing. So, you know, I spent so much time trying to get away from quick stop while I worked there. It was like, oh my God, is it 1030 yet? So we can close and I could do anything fucking else but this. And then slowly ameliorated the place so that it became more habitable. Like, you know, if I'm not going to be working at the video store, well, I'll just bring a TV and a VCR and, you know, to the, to the convenience store and watch movies there because I have a whole video store there. And what's the difference? You know, it's just <laughs> deal with more people, but this will make the day go by quicker. Yeah. So, you know, the irony was making clerks gets me out of, quick stop forever and in a very rosebud like fashion you know quick stop remains this shining beacon that while i was there you know i was like oh i can't believe i gotta be there and ever since i've been gone like the work just brings me back i, I spend a lot of time making media making movies or comic books or podcasts or fucking tv shows at this point about a very specific time in my life when I was working at Quick Stop. And I've, you know, done other shit like Red State, which is it has nothing to do with Quick Stop, of course, or Cop Tusk, Out. Cop Out, like all the shit that has that's not BSQ universe oriented. But like I I love doing that stuff because it, it allows me to go back to yeah. one of the greatest moments of my life that in the moment while it was happening, I enjoyed my life. I just hated working. Um, and then, you know, the dream was like, get a job where you don't feel like, you know, that it is a job. So that was the pursuit for RST video. It's like, mm -hmm. if I work at a video store, this will never feel like fucking working. Yeah. And then when I got there, they were like, well, we want you to work the convenience store more. And, you know, at first I was like, this sucks. And then that changed everything. So being able to go back nearly fucking 30 years later and own Quick Stop to the place where I could work there, I was working there. And, you know, I just wasn't doing what I used to do. And I could leave any time I wanted. And, you know, not worry about like, well, who's going to lock up? Who's in charge? Um, that 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 might have been satisfying on so many levels in a way that nothing I've ever done before has been. Because not only do I'm like, hey, there's a whole movie to show for the time we spent there. But there was this whole spiritual, like, you know, renewal of being able to go back and and fucking live the happiest time of your life. You know, like some fuckers go to Gretzky fantasy camp and pay like 10, 20 grand to fucking get on the ice with Gretzky and shoot around and shit like that. This was like going to like Kevin Smith fantasy camp because, <laughs> but for one guy only, because <laughs> I was the one that got the most out of it. Nobody else really, you know, like, Brian and, and Walter were there for a couple of days, but, you know, Brian maybe might be the only one to get his head around the idea because he used to work at the stores too. Okay. Of like, oh, let's, like, how fun would it be to work at the stores and not have to work at the stores? And, you know, I, I don't even think he fantasizes about that shit. So <laughs> for me, like, you know, there was a version of, Clerks, before it was Clerks 3, there was a, a version of the movie where I was like, well, maybe I do this flick where Kevin Smith, like, wants to go back and work at the store again. And, you know, I was like, for a day or two, building this whole would-be movie where, like, I got Brian to play himself and shit, and it was me post-heart attack, and I was like, 
I want to go back to the store. And, and so that was going to be the flick. And then I realized like, no, I could just do it with Dante. And, I could do it with Dante and Randall yeah, instead yeah. of like me and stuff. But I did get to have my cake and eat it too, because the experience of going and making Clerks 3 was that aspect of, you know, wish fulfillment of like, oh my God, I'm going to get Brian and go back and like work at the store for a very specific period of time in the structure of a narrative of a movie. Instead, I got to go back and play with Dante and Randall again and extend the Buick universe. But on the personal level, I got that, like, oh my God, I got to work at Quick Stop again and in the best way possible. Because you can leave at any time. <laughs> yeah, not in a way of like, you've got to be here from like fucking 10.30 till 10.30. Because uh, we had like 12 hour days like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah but yeah. it was hard, like in retrospect. You know, it's like you're... 475, you know, thank you. The cash register does most of the work for you because it's all math. All you have to do is punch it in. And, you know, if we'd ever, if they'd ever gotten ambitious at Quick Stop and gotten a scanning system, the job would have been even easier and shit. I went into a quick check in Highlands, my hometown, and you could check yourself out. Now that's robot clerks and shit. You don't yeah. even need a human being and shit at the counter. Yeah, so, and that, I, yeah I, that robot could be. I, I'm not even supposed to be here today, too. Exactly. That <laughs> robot is also having an existential crisis at work one day. <laughs> but yeah, I think honestly, maybe Clerks Three was the most satisfying on a couple on so many levels. Like, not only did I get a movie to show for it, but like, I also got to go to like Fantasy Camp, my own version of Fantasy Camp, yeah. where I got to recreate like 1989 to 1993. Um, wow, it was pretty pretty magical. But uh, honestly, like there, even the shit that didn't work out, like even Cop Out, which like you know was with, not without its fucking travails and shit and uphill battles. Um, in retrospect, was like, oh man, like I remember it fondly. I don't sit there and go like, oh, oh my god. Like I remember, you know the the bliss of of working with a crew that like absolutely adored me and finding out that I was a good director outside of my own films. You know what I'm saying? Like here I was working at a studio for a studio with studio crew, none of my people except for like Dave Klein. And I got to find out like that, oh, it's not just like, everyone you work with knows you so they like you like you're you're good at this outside of like your own sets your like, own crew yeah yeah like in a, in a, i could have been a director like like kind of like i said with red state the whole idea of like wow it could have been all different like i could have had a way different career the career everyone else kind of has but if i had the career that everyone else kind of had It'd be over by now, for sure, man. Like, you get bored. Uh, I'm bored. They just wouldn't let me do it. Like, when you have the career that everyone else has, at a certain point, you're at their mercy. Because yeah, yeah, they yeah. got to hire you to make their movies because you don't have your own anymore. Yeah, and you, so, it, the creative element at, is taken out of it a little bit to some degree, too, because you have to well, listen not to even that. Not, not so much the creative element is taken out. It's just you're dependent on somebody else to be like, we choose you to do our thing. Mm. And by being the kind of filmmaker I've been, there's never been a moment where I had to wait to be chosen. I chose myself over and over and over again. So that that to me has been, you know, more satisfying. It would have, would have been more respectable to mm. have a different career where like, you know, I tried to get better each time and I tried to win Academy Awards or fucking box office meant something or shit like that whatever the fuck mm -hmm. uh, whatever a non Kevin Smith career is but the career I've had like has allowed me to continue almost three decades in at this point whereas if I was a work for hire guy then I'm probably out of the business by now because they always hire younger you know, yeah, higher old. I would maybe I would have gravitated toward TV directing. I, I don't know. I guess I, that probably would have been a thing. Um, 
but yeah, I, it's, it's been a, like a wonderful singular career. It's like, been a fun life. <laughs> yeah, you know, very much so. And, and I, when I look at my long tail, like, I'm like, all right, like, yeah, man, I can vouch for all that shit. That was literally all the shit that I wanted to do. Like yeah. nothing in there is like, well, I got fucking forced to do that one. Even cop out <laughs> was something that like I, I chose to do. I was like, oh, this would be fucking cool to make this movie like an eighties movie. So yeah, it's, I'm, I've been so happy with it. Younger version of me thought that it would all be dictated by box office. Um, critics, critical notices and box office. Um, and I'm, an old version of me doesn't think that at all. And I don't know if that's because I grew up or because I had no choice <laughs> to eventually have to accept it. Like, you're not going to have critical notices and you're not going to have box office. But you could still make the shit you want to make. It'll still make, make you happy. Um, yeah. It'll make a bunch of people happy. And if you're lucky, it'll age well over time that was definitely the lesson of mall rats which was like in the moment the movie was dead and over and now fucking 25 plus years on 27 years on that's it's like a gold standard for some people like yeah it's, like, it's why can't you be like mall rats and i'm like wow man fucking i never it back. To hear that shit yeah that's a reversal of fortune right there it's like randall says i'm bringing it back <laughs> <laughs> now are we looking to have anything to that extreme in clerks three <laughs> i you know it's have weird. you pushed that envelope with, with in clerks three because now with everything changing in the world and people are so sensitive are, are are you gonna have something that extreme in that movie there is something i don't think anything will be that extreme in, ever again um i, I <laughs> I think like like at one there are moments in Clerks Three um, that are meta outrageous, um, you know, like here in reboot with the chasing Amy sequence, um, we were able to throw in the bit about like you know when when Alyssa's just like. Um, um, it'd been better told from a female perspective or yeah, a gay perspective or anything but a cis white male or something like that, which is the criticism that I've received for that movie for like the last 10 years. I know. <laughs> um, I got to put that in to the flick. There's something in Clerks which we get to address that, you know, is, is pushes at the edge of the envelope. But I'm trying to think, is there anything where I'm like, <laughs> is this outrageous enough? I mean, I think it's so weird. After Tusk, I never felt the need to like push the edge of the envelope again. Yeah. Like, cause I was like, well, that's how you push the edge of the envelope. Like, you know, fucking, um, but I'm trying to think what, what in clerks resembles Clerks 2. Oddly enough, that's not the aspect of Clerks 2 that I am always trying to mimic. The whole reason Clerks 3 exists because I just wanted to do the jail scene from Clerks 2 over and over and over again. <laughs> I know because for if like, you... For like yeah. 90 minutes and that's kind of what Clerks 3 is to me. Yeah, but, it, it's uh, uh, it's pretty much the growing up of Randall. Very much so. It's the sequel to the jail scene. Yeah, it's, um, it's literally continuing on from that scene and which How is weird because it's not like immediately Grandma after gross. that scene. It's like it literally takes place. Let me see. We made the six, 16 years later. Like, because uh, I think we did Clerks in 2 in 2006. And then we're tw uh, 2022. So, yeah, 16 years later. Okay. Randall gets to grow up. I mean, it's two parts to his growing up, right? Like, yeah. he grows up at the end of Clerks 2 and they by the store and they're like all right well that's it happily ever after and then shit turns back to gray and <laughs> this flick has like the kind of uh, you know like if clerks i always say like clerks was about my how i saw life in my 20s and 
clerks too is how i saw life in my 30s and like those cats had their clerks moment in clerks too my clerks moment was i made clerks and suddenly i you know was in charge of my own life yeah at the end of clerks they're still working for some other asshole <laughs> it's not till the end of clerks too that they get their own independence so to speak where they're in charge of their lives um but they got like job type jobs they own the store yeah um clerks three is about like the creative release like a guy who faces the fucking end and realizes like you know i almost died and i'm not sad that i didn't get married or have kids or leave new jersey i just can't believe i've sat around watching movies and never thought of making one myself well fuck it that's what i want to do now so that's it's you know he gets to kind of i don't know if that would be growing up but he he gets what i got which is like creative fulfillment like dante and randall presumably have financial fulfillment because they own their own store yeah and when we meet them in clerks three you know it looks like the store is doing well and they've got like him and you know it's him dante randall and elias so they can support three salaries um but you know this is creative like independence or, or wish fulfillment or realizing that the end is closer than the beginning and you don't have time to do all the shit that when you were a kid you're like oh i would be cool if i did that so <laughs> it, it's uh it's yeah it's there's outrageous stuff in it but the most like there's no like um I was gonna say there's no like 37 my girlfriend sucked 37 dicks but there is <laughs> like again <laughs> so oh, well it, it, uh, unless there's uh, you know he references hermaphroditic porn again who knows or if he tries to create a movie that has hermaphroditic porn <laughs> there is uh i'm trying to think there's do we touch hermaphrodites which sounds way filthier than i meant it <laughs> I, I i think it's it's weird because now you know when we made clerks it was very easy to be like out there yeah because nobody was doing it so we we're like all right i'm gonna do it and then you know Everybody else follows suit and be, well, and that yeah, became a little, the norm. Bit, a little bit because we did it. Like, I'll never forget <laughs> Owen Gleiberman in, I think it was Entertainment Weekly he was reviewing for at the time. When he reviewed Clerks, he goes, this is what a sitcom is going to look like in 10 years and sound like. And, you know, I, I remember being insulted by that. And he didn't mean it as an insult, but he was just like, now that this has happened, 10 years from now, People will rip it off. <laughs> on TV, yeah. And so, like, in a weird way, like, to to kind of go like, all right, how do I push the edge of the envelope this time is so, like, like feels thirsty. Because yeah. now, like, you know, we live in a world where there's an episode of Black Mirror where the fucking UK – premier fucks a pig yeah the prime minister yes yeah the pm <laughs> not the premier yeah the pm the prime minister fucks a pig like i remember seeing that and being like we should all go home <laughs> nobody's <laughs> ever gonna fucking make anything better than that that's fucking crazy and yet you know people make new shit all the time yeah so like something like euphoria pushes at the edges of the envelope now like mm. i i you know i don't have that in me and so I kind of did make a decision of like, do I, you know, is there, do I have a centerpiece like scene that like this happens or like an out there moment? And I realized like in, you know, 16 years since Clerks 2, nobody, people don't talk to me about the donkey show as much as they talk to me about the jail scene. Like that's, <laughs> the scene that people bring up the most and it's like all right so if you're going to honor something that has like apparently lasted 
like something that really captured folks imagination and stayed with them yeah you know it, oddly enough it's not the thing where i'm like hey man this guy fucks a donkey isn't that fucked up it's um or trevor on the side jerking off while watching it <laughs> yeah typically, <laughs> yes it's just so weird to me like that did happen and i never really think about that aspect but yeah he <laughs> off that. his character gets to do some interesting things in clerks three um cool and he goes on a journey which i so like, he's not the shemp anymore does he get a shemp for himself does he, he get does. to pick on like randall <laughs> he, does. he does absolutely awesome. um, but he, unlike randall like he you know alliance isn't the kind of person to i was abused so i will visit abuse on others he's the other archetype which is like because i was abused I will abuse no others. And <laughs> oh, okay, cool. he has his own side, to it, but his sidekick, it, 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 theirs is a very warm relationship. <laughs> of them in the Rings, probably, movie <laughs> and Transformers. Yes, they, share, they share passion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think I've taken a lot of your time already, but is there anything that you want to plug that you've been doing? Obviously, that Kevin Smith club that I'm a i'm a part of yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm a yoga hoser uh obviously there'll be more events coming up for that and coming weekends uh you're doing something live i believe soon as well yeah, i'm doing uh what are we doing i'm doing a thing on uh i go to jersey on thursday friday we shoot something at the stash so friday night we're gonna meet at smod castle do that kevin smith club awesome. state of the union there um and then um, we've got, there's an announcement this week about something I've been working on. Um, then it looks like the beginning of July is when the trailer for Clerks 3 drops and the tickets will go on sale for the tour. Uh, meantime, I'm still going to Comic Cons. Like, so I'm be at the Denver Fan Expo, the Chicago Fan Expo um, for the next, uh, month or two and then it's clerks tour all fall all throughout the fall awesome some things to look forward to for all my listeners out there and people are reviewing this uh also you will probably be doing a, an interview with uh, the one the only ben beck who is uh part of the next level online radio podcast network that this podcast is on ben mm -hmm. actually uh moderated your panel in philly you did a great job He's an amazing man, and I have to thank Ben because he is yet another influence for me getting into podcasting. Not only it was you, Chris Hardwick, Ben, and my friend Jason Cabassi, and if it wasn't for Ben, I wouldn't be on here doing what I do. So I have to thank Ben. Uh, I just want to thank you for being on, and I look forward to seeing you with uh, your future events. In a heartbeat, man. Uh, I'm glad we got to do it. Was it episode 200? This is episode 200. Fucking A. Uh, was it, were you trying to get me for episode 100? Actually, I had Mike and Ming for, for 100? episode 100. So not uh, only did I have. Now you're working your way up to Tesdy. For 300, you'll get those guys. Yeah, I, I got to get in touch with Walt. You know, now Walt's actually on the com, uh, con circuit again. He went he down. Went to Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. Him and uh, get him went down there and i'm surprised he drove all the way down there <laughs> um for i think he was at the the blue juice uh table to skirt the that he drew and stuff but yeah it was crazy it was, i remember when the guy from fan expo was like um we were at not the one in orlando but i guess st louis show and he's like uh walter's coming to orlando is there anything special we should do and i was like my Walter Flanagan? <laughs> He's going to a Comic Con by choice? He's yeah. like, yeah, come down. I was like, holy shit. I said, I was like, put him on, uh, you know, uh, get old with us because we had a show that night. But I don't know if the message got to him. But huh. uh, yeah, yeah, that was, it was crazy when I heard that too. I'm like, oh my God. Like, if you live long enough, you get to see all the things you wish for. <laughs> um, <laughs> Walter would willingly go to cons. I dragged him to a lot of cons or not dragged him personally, but like made him and Brian fucking drive all the way out to Comic Con to sell shit and whatnot. Or Terrificon in Connecticut, which I've been to. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it uh, seeing Walt do that uh, makes me happy. Uh, yeah. I look forward to seeing whatever Walt's doing. I do miss him at the stash. Mike's been doing an excellent job. So I'm loving what Tez has to do. So uh, all you listeners, obviously go listen to everything that's on the Smodco network. So you could actually hear Kevin. You could listen to Tez You could listen to Mike and Ming. And Ming's always out there, too, doing his own thing, too. Always. Both those guys are committed to podcasting with Shared Universe. Yep. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening. This was Panels to Pixels, and we'll see you on the next panel.